Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for yeah, allowed. Thank you for joining, especially end of the afternoon after lots of talks and everything going on today. Really appreciate you guys being here. So, hope this is what you were expecting because this is what you're getting. Um, top five tips for successfully developing on a hybrid edge cloud solution. Um, I'm Samuel Hale, Sam Hale. An analyst at Mock Nation, um, which is a little bit different than a lot of the talks you've been to, where it's been predominantly sort of developer folks. Um, so I'm an analyst. I do a lot of developer things, though, despite working as an analyst, which is a little bit atypical. Um, I run our IoT test environment at Mock Nation. And I, as it says, I have a background in systems architect. Um, I've also done a lot of analytics, a lot of middleware, things of that nature and I join you guys today from rainy, cold Boston. So I just wanna sort of run through what I wanna talk about. So who are we? Don't worry, you haven't missed anything yet. <laughs> who are we um, as a firm, what we do, and then I wanna talk a little bit about hybrid edge cloud solutions and really some of the insight that we've gained. And we've got this both from, from vendors and from service providers, and you know, this is really our domain. Um, and that's because we are one of the only, or the only industry analyst firm that's dedicated to IoT. So we only do IoT platforms, IoT middleware, things that are tangentially related to IoT, but that's really our focus. Um, so we have sort of a specialized understanding. We, we use these things, you know, we don't just look at marketing and slides and decks and come to our opinions, we actually get hands on with them. Um, and in fact, uh, here where it says, uh, tested dozens of platforms in our test environment, Mighty, which is a very clever acronym for Mock Nation Internet of Things test environment, um, we take these platforms and we put them through 70 or technically 71 developer workflows. So those are things like setting up a rules engine, building out dashboards, building out various types of functionality that customers may actually want in their production environments. And we basically grade them on that. We grade how long it takes them to do it, and we talk about you know, how complete they are, how sophisticated their solution is. So we get sort of down into the, into the weeds on these things. Um, and we're in our fifth year of business, and we're headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. So again, just a little more about us, um, some of our clients. We work with industrial enterprises, we work with tech vendors, service providers, we work both sides of the picture. So we'll work with a company that's providing an IoT platform, and we'll work with customers who want an IoT solution. So we try to get you know, both ends of it to really understand the whole IoT picture that's out there. So why do we do this? Why is this important? And it's, as you guys probably quite well know, uh, IoT is the wild west. I mean, this is still a very new field. It's changing very rapidly. It's still sort of exploding, expanding. Um, and there isn't the same sort of clear direction, clear solutions, clear architectures that may exist in other aspects out there in the IT, uh, OT world. So we focus predominantly around what we call application enablement platforms, um, AEPs, or device management platforms, but you can really think of an AEP, if you're not familiar with that, that terminology, as sort of a horizontal solution. Um, you may implement a specific vertical use case around it, but we're looking for platforms that can really adapt to sort of different, uh, different solutions. And again, just want to plug our, our test lab. We think it's pretty unique. We don't think many other people are doing anything like that. Um, so there it is. And like all of you here today, we are always learning. This is a field that's rapidly evolving, rapidly changing, and we always want more feedback. We always want to understand cool new use cases. We want to understand if you're doing a traditional use case in a new way, in a novel way, you know, we always want to learn more. That's our job as industry analysts. So here's the crux of what the talk is about. Um, we live in an and world. You know, we want to have our cake and eat it too. And specifically today, what that means is we want edge and cloud solutions in IoT. And you know, we have a quote here from John Chambers, um, but we really think that this is going to be the path going forwards in IoT. 
Um, you know, we think about half of all enterprise deployments you know, in the next 10 or so years are gonna be some kind of hybrid edge cloud solution. You know, um, and <laughs> there are, of course, many use cases, and we'll get into that um, in a second, but there are, are distinct advantages that come from being able to marry both a cloud solution with its big data processing and local edge capabilities. And specifically, you know, these are, obviously there are many, many different things we could talk about in terms of where edge is good, where cloud is good. I don't really need to explain what the cloud is to you guys, you know quite well. Um, but some of the highlights in terms of what we're looking at in IoT, you know, massive computational capacity, you can have terabyte, petabyte scale, data lakes, you can do huge amounts of data processing, distributed processing, um, and you get the advantage of geodiversity and geo-redundancy. So you can get high availability configurations, all this sort of stuff. But what we're perhaps less, I mean, this, this crew here, you guys are also pretty familiar, but you know, the advantages of the edge are you know, predominantly latency. You know, it might seem fast to us to say 500 millisecond round trip to go to the cloud, execute a rule and come back, or maybe 1,000 milliseconds. But that can be a long time depending upon what you're actually trying to actuate based off of a rule. And on top of that, if you lose your connectivity to the cloud, you know, let's say a backhoe hits the fiber going into your building. Let's say you're on an oil rig or a remote site and for some reason your satellite link goes down. You don't want all of your IoT devices to just freeze. You know, maybe some IoT devices will have some sort of buffer, they'll have some sort of queue, they might collect some data, but you know, you want something that can continue to act in whatever role you have it assigned, regardless of whether it has its connection to some sort of northbound cloud. And the other big advantage of this, especially in, uh, in manufacturing and certain types of industrial environments, is you get local processing. So, you know, let's say you have a pressure sensor, some sort of device, and you want to sample that at a relatively high resolution. You know, maybe you're trying to pull a 50, 60 hertz sample rate, right? That's way too much data, traditionally speaking, to send all of that northbound. And it's also a waste. The majority of that's going to be something that's predicted, is totally what you expect. You don't care about it necessarily. But you might care about variations, you might care about st literally standard deviations or some sort of analytic method based off of that, or you might care about some sort of aggregated average. You might want to know what the average is every minute or every second despite a very high sampling resolution, and your edge processing allows you to do things like that. You also can have full rule engines and all sorts of more complex logic at the edge if your solution dictates it. Um, but the idea is that we want to effectively marry these two things so that we can get the best of both worlds. Again, we want to live in that and world, not in the or world. So obviously this can be done many different ways. Um, we looked at two different solutions and we're gonna go into one of them here. Unfortunately, the litmus demo we don't have today. Um, there are some challenges of getting that together, um, but I'll mention in a second because it is relevant, particularly here at a Cisco event. But the idea is we wanna synchronize data and application logic from the cloud to the edge, and we want to do it in some sort of manageable way. You don't want to be, you know, SSHing in to a thousand devices to try to update code or sort of manage a rule on that device. That's not, you know, a very efficient solution. And the other, you know, major sort of element here is you want to be able to adjust your, your platform architecture to meet whatever your demand is, whatever your requirements are. And having an edge that you can put in place, get connected to your systems, and then you can adjust what it's actually doing after the fact, after you've already installed it, especially in remote sites or other places, is a very, very uh, you know, powerful tool to have uh, at your disposal. So I have a quick little demo here, and then we'll sort of get into the, the takeaways out of this whole process and what we've learned, again, from, from vendors and from, from sort of solution providers. Um, this is a vendor called Clearblade. Um, they have an excellent solution. And let's see, this should play full screen. If it wants to behave, there we go. Oops. So I just want to preface this quickly with, uh, in this case, we already have a pre-deployed edge device, um, which is that pump edge there. And what we're doing here is we're pushing a deployment down to it. So in this case, we have a table called devices. And we can selectively choose how we want to sync that. You can get even more granular if you want. Services in this context is uh, effectively a microservice, so a JavaScript um, application. And in this case, it's something quite straightforward. It's basically just a piece of code that's going to have our edge push upstream data it's going to collect from a sensor. 
And then we have all these other options of things we can push around. Um, again, in this particular case, the reason why we like this as a demo is this is very easy. Not everything always needs to be declarative. Sometimes that's not a solution that's going to work. Sometimes you need to get into code or scripting or something more complicated. But we just want to show you that it can really be this easy to take code that was written in the cloud layer, you know, completely done in a cloud IDE, and push it down to uh, an edge device, um, which will happen in a second. A little slow with the mouse this day. And then we can take a look. So this is uh, it actually coming down to the edge device. So this is, I believe, running on a Nook here, um, an Intel Nook. And you can just basically see it. You know, again, it's been pushed from the cloud side. It's loading all the logic down. And in a second, we'll get the sort of magic output of all of this, uh, sort of just showing the, you know, the end result of what happens when you push this trigger down. And although this dashboard right here is actually a cloud dashboard, you can have the exact same solution running on your edge. So if you want this running locally within your factory, you can have the same kind of dashboarding system and whatnot. And even though this isn't the most aesthetically appealing right here, uh, it is very flexible. Um, and the whole, again, the whole idea here is that you can selectively choose what logic you want to push down to the edge. You can selectively choose what data and what tables are syncing, how triggers work, all sorts of other capability. Um, and you know, Clearblade does a good job at this. There are other vendors that do this as well. Cisco has some of this capability too. But it is possible. This is not fairy dust magic. This is a real world solution out there in market today. So this is the real meat of it, is what, what are our takeaways? What have we learned? What have we heard from these vendors? What have we heard from our customers? you know, um, in terms of getting an effective hybrid solution out there in the market. And the first tip here is uh, <laughs> very funny, especially in the Cisco, Cisco crowd, but, you know, single vendor solutions help a lot in this domain. And that may not always be a popular opinion to take. Everyone wants to have flexibility. No one wants vendor tie-in. But it really does make a big difference when you're talking about these hybrid solutions because they are very reliant on strong interoperability between the cloud layer and the edge layer. And obviously, you get all of the advantages out of that, um, consistent you know, platforms, consistent APIs, and of course, the sort of biz dev stuff of you, know, you get a single contact point for sales, for implementation, and for support. And again, you don't necessarily need to use a single vendor, but if you're looking at a brand new implementation, it really does save a lot of headache, especially right now. Um, this may change in the future um, because we're starting to see industry standards around edge cloud connectivity. And obviously, you know, there's a few other talks here about the myriad of IoT protocols out there. And a lot of those are focused around sort of moving the data around. So obviously, you're probably all familiar with something like MQTT, that's great, it's very flexible, it's very optimized for IoT. It provides absolutely no structure for how you manage devices. You can you know, put messages into it, you can encode stuff into it that'll tell devices to do something, but there's no structure to it. So every vendor and every guy who's running an agent on a gateway is gonna do it a different way. So you can say, great, we have MQTT, but we still need to write integrations for a bunch of different vendor solutions, and that's not necessarily the best solution. So, We've seen a lot of adoption of lightweight machine to machine. I don't know how familiar you guys know this. Informal raise of hands. I guys heard of lightweight M to M before. Yeah, and see that's the point, right? This is an emerging standard which is actually very well defined and very well done. It's an OMA spec, but it's not really super heavily adopted yet. But we've seen, especially in large enterprise platforms that don't always sort of appeal or even are visible to to developers this has seen a lot of adoption. And it's seen a lot of adoption specifically because it provides a standardized method for device management and edge management, in addition to a standardized method for data ingestion and data forwarding. Uh, typically, it's paired with CoAP, but it can actually use a bunch of different protocols as well. Uh, but the important thing is it's a very well-defined and very well-structured spec. So I would say this is a requirement if you're looking for a multi-vendor solution. You need something that follows a very tight spec so you can take your edge hardware, your edge you know, gateway agent from one vendor and plug it into another vendor. Um, I would still say it's suggested, even if you're dealing with a single vendor solution, it's good to see how they're actually handling this sort of control plane versus the data plane. And again, a lot of emphasis is placed on the data plane, 
not so much on the control plane. And that's a problem because the data plane in some ways is actually easier to architect around. Everyone knows how to ingest data, everyone knows how to take that and then put it through some pipeline or do something with it. Managing the device management aspect, the control plane is not so straightforward. And again, it can vary a lot. So this is tip number two is that industry standards do matter. So this is another one that um, can potentially be a little bit controversial, um, but use purpose-built IoT Edge hardware. I have a very nice photo of a green field to go with this green field idea. And the truth is that while you can go into a factory or an existing you know, infrastructure and try to get a 10-year-old, 15-year-old PLC controller to talk to your modern IoT solution, you really don't need to bother with that. Commodity IoT hardware is cheap. Even an Intel NUC, which is a very powerful you know, quad-core modern x86 system, doesn't cost that much money in terms of you know, industrial deployment or you know, even medium or large, large enterprise deployment. There's really no need to sort of muck around with trying to get tons of legacy devices to speak modern protocols, to talk with modern paradigms, when you can just throw a gateway next to them have that direct, you know, integrate directly with them and call it a day. And that is actually what we've seen in general in industry. It's not so common for people to try to take older legacy hardware and repurpose it, retask it. It's often much simpler just to drop in new purpose-built hardware. Um, in particular, this also can be helpful with the next tip. And this one, um, depending upon how many of you have had to do deployments with this stuff, um, compliance dictates architecture, unfortunately. And depending upon what industry you're in, this is a very, very big deal. If you're in oil and gas, for example, they are one of the most compliance regulation-based industries out there. Um, you may sit down and you may think, oh, hey, you know, we have X number of devices, X number of sensors, we're trying to ingest this sort of data. Let's throw a gateway in there and call it a day. But then you'll find out that their particular model of compliance, you know, we, Purdue model is a good example, requires different types of physical isolation and different types of data isolation. So sometimes you may have to do silly things like put three or four gateways doing somewhat redundant jobs onto your factory floor in order to follow whatever the specific compliance or regulatory you know, requirements are. Um, obviously there are other industries too, like manufacturing, you know, people are really touchy about that. Not many factory managers are gonna let their IT people go in and interfere with their OT stuff. You know, a robot, you know, let's say a robotic arm may be working in close proximity to humans. And even though there are regulations for how that goes, you know, they don't want anyone touching something that is potentially, you know, interacting with humans in a, in a close way. There's huge safety implications, liability implications that are involved in that. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that it works this way, but when you're looking at real world IoT implementations, especially ones that involve, you know, marrying cloud layers, back down to, to a local edge layer, compliance is a very, very complicated matter. Um, but it can be done is the important thing. There's almost no environment where you can't find a solution. It just may be a somewhat convoluted, at least in terms of technical architecture solution. And this one, this point here really can't be can't be overemphasized. And if you're not as familiar with IoT, you may not be as familiar with this concept that I keep referring to of device management or edge management. And this is really about you know, providing these, these services here. So security updates, you know, functionality, configuration, connectivity management, diagnostics. So you may want to be provisioning or deprovisioning a SIM card, something like you know, Cisco Jasper is often used to manage that kind of, that kind of connectivity, that kind of provisioning. Um, but you might also want to put out, push out security updates. Um, you guys may be familiar with the fact that almost every single x86 processor built has a fundamental flaw in it. That flaw needs to be patched, generally speaking, at the kernel level. A lot of people will say, well, you know, our hardware is not in a shared environment. We're not, we're not susceptible to this. But you probably still are in some way or another. A lot of work has gone, of course, over the last several months to patch these, you know, it's often referred as the Intel CPU bug. But really, obviously, there's several different types, and it really affects almost every single x86 processor out there. And you need the ability to push out a huge amount of security updates to a whole bunch of devices. If you don't have this plan in place from, you know, from the get-go, 
um, which is oftentimes not the case with IoT, then you're going to be in trouble. Um, obviously, it's nice that you know these days we have mobile device management, we have management for PCs, for you know for Mac products, it's all great, but it's often overlooked in IoT because you're just trying to get something out there, try to get it integrated and get it working. You're not thinking necessarily about the sort of long-term life cycle of that device. And the really important point here is that it's really hard to do this after the fact. You know, let's say you're doing some sort of um, tolling implementation, right? You have an IoT gateway up on a gantry on the highway. It costs a lot of money to close the highway or divert lanes to get that thing up there. You don't want to have to go out and do that again to roll out a security update or you know, probably not a configuration update, but or to roll out a new type of device management solution that's very difficult to do. And there are very limited scenarios where you're even able to completely change the device agent and completely change the underlying device management uh, system that's out there on deployed assets. And on top of this, if you want to talk about security and you really care about having end-to-end -end security, if you want hardware root of trust in your IoT devices, you need to have a strategy for that in place before they leave your control. You know, if you want something that's leveraging TPM or leveraging you know, some sort of hardware, hardware store for certificates, for authenticity or for encryption, you really need to have that plan in place before you put that device into the field. And all of that is under this umbrella of device management. So that's really the meat of it. Um, and just to recap, you know, single vendor solutions do help. Um, obviously, you get lots of integration out of that. There are industry standards for these things, and not just for data transit. There are actually standards for device management that are being adopted, um, specifically that lightweight machine-to-machine, uh, -machine, lightweight M2M. Uh, that is one of the most requested uh, capabilities that we've heard from customers who are going out and looking to do not you know, proof of concept, not small scale, but looking to do a complete rework of their architecture, they almost always want something that supports that. Um, that's why I say it's kind of funny that people don't know it so much, but it's very, very important out there. Um, Purpose-built IoT hardware is, again, great. You want to make sure, if you can, you use fresh stuff. It just really makes everyone's life much easier. Compliance dictates architecture, again, unfortunately, but it is the way it is. And you really need to start edge management from the get-go. It should really be, if you're, if you're trying to design an effective IoT solution, you really should be trying to consider that from the very, very outset. So quick presentation. I know a little bit less light on technical details. It's the end of the afternoon. But those are, our, are what we sort of uh, learned from talking to all these different parts of the industry. So thank you. And do you guys have any questions about any of the stuff covered here? <laughs> It's a good question. I would say, in terms of platforms out there, probably maybe a quarter. In terms of devices that are actually deployed, though, I would say there, there are a few legacy standards, like TR069, you guys probably may be familiar with, and there's some OMA DM is another one that's out there. Those are both legacy sort of standards for DM. But in terms of total IoT devices and how many of them are using one of those, including the legacy protocols, I would say the vast majority. I'd say probably 60, 70%, if not more. Um, you know, your cable modem in your house, which is controlled by a device management platform, is using TRS69. Um, obviously, it's invisible to us in day-to-day -day practice. Almost every device that's mass deployed by a, a solutions provider is using one of these legacy standards underneath. So not all platforms support it, but not that many platforms actually are running millions and millions of devices in reality. And those that do tend to support at least one of these specs. Uh, many. <laughs> it's obviously a very, a very hot button topic in terms of IoT. Unfortunately, the well has been poisoned by sort of consumer equipment because obviously that's sort of what's public facing. People buy a smart camera, right, to use at their home and they find out that it, you know, was not well designed um, and obviously has security issues. The problem is that the expectations for a piece of equipment going into a factory or going onto an oil rig are very different than the expectations for what you're buying for a consumer bottom dollar off Amazon, right? So I would say that in general, security is pretty well addressed in industrial and enterprise IoT deployments. It's not something that's thought about last. It's something that you know, people are asking about from, from the outset. 
you can't find an arch diagram for an IoT solution that does not include security on it. Not all of those solutions are equally well done. I think hardware root of trust, and especially the sort of zero touch provisioning stuff that's very new, um, helps to address a lot of that um, because you do get you know, some, some protections from having certificates burnt in at manufacturing and then enrolled. Um, but I do think, and I know this may sound a little silly, but I do think it's actually done pretty well in enterprise and in industry. It is not done well at all in the consumer space. But that's a function of the fact that a company manufacturing a cheap camera just doesn't have to care. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. It's not in their financial interest to build a secure device. It's in their financial interest to build the cheapest possible device, get it to market, and sell it, right? Um, that sort of address it or some follow-up? Yeah. So there is. Um, certain customers will run services locally on edges that do some manner of you know, uh, IPS or something like that. I would say, generally speaking, um, it tends to fall back to dedicated hardware. So if someone wants to, to have that kind of inline protection, they're probably going to put a dedicated appliance in to whatever their, wherever their edge is and use that that way. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't take like Snort and you know run Snort in line on one of these edge devices. They're certainly the you know like an Intel NUC. They're more than capable of handling that, but it's not something that we've seen too often. Do you track? I'm sorry, I came in late. Do you track huh. uh, communication protocol and how they're changing over time from the old school of wired uh, SIM based? I've seen that in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Laura and MBIOT and all these, right? Um, we do. I don't have any immediately accessible statistics on that. Um, are you talking specifically wireless later or wireless? So most of it these days is, is wireless. For small, you know, battery powered sensors. Yep. So there, there are great things like Z-Wave, like you and I mentioned before. Um, BTLE is a uh, low energy is, is very popular. Um, I would say that Things like SigFox, although that's more predominant in Europe than in the Americas, um, MBIOT, which is very popular in China, is starting to become popular in America to a certain degree. Um, LoRa is great. There are, there are a lot of protocols that are used for that. Um, the nice thing, generally speaking, about them is that if you have a good device management solution, they tend to include connectivity management. So they will work relatively protocol agnostic. So you will have to make sure that obviously your particular solution works with your chosen you know, wireless, whether it's WAN or cellular or whatever technology, but it can be done. I'd say probably the most common though that we see is just typical 3G, 4G, and then tapping into something like Cisco Jasper on the back end in order to manage provisioning for that, um, or whatever the particular system is for that carrier. Um, and there are even some fun things too, like some vendors will give you, you know, multi-network sims that can do fun tricks and things of that nature. So you mean like edge, so sort of edge only then in that case, but you're saying like on. Edge processing and do it all right at the devices and sensors Exactly. 20 years, 50 years? I think it's, it's now, depending upon what you're trying to do. So um, this clear blade stack here, which unfortunately I don't have a exactly better demo of, um, their entire solution can run on the edge only on appropriate hardware. So you're not going to get that to run on, you know, constricted single core, you know, arm kind of thing. But, uh, well, m maybe. But typically you'd want to run it on multi-core x86 kind of setup. Um, but that is a complete IoT solution that will run edge only. It does not require any cloud connectivity. 
if you do not want or have no need for cloud connectivity, you can do all your rules engine, your data analytics, all your processing, all your management completely local. Um, in terms of it happening on the actual collection device, I don't think that will probably ever happen because I have a suspicion that those will be sort of um, economized more towards cheap and easily interconnect. The actual sensor will probably remain relatively dumb and they'll still want to hit a local edge that's going to do the actual aggregation and management of it. Um, that's just my personal opinion or projection. Um, but you already can have complete IoT solutions that are not cloud-based. Um, in fact, many customers, e even if they're, you know, some of them will use a private cloud, right? But there are plenty of solutions in industry right now that are only on-prem and on-prem alone. Um, Um, Litmus does a great job with this. Um, if I really wanted to know, I'd probably have to look at one of our scorecards. Um, another good example, I mean... <laughs> yes and no. Um, both Azure and AWS have tried to break into the edge processing game. If you go look, um, something called Greengrass from AWS is their sort of first attempt. Um, it's actually now into its sort of second major overhaul. They have, if you look through uh, sort of their marketing material and their product announcements, you'll see they've put a huge emphasis on Greengrass. They really want to make Greengrass competitive with the more fully developed solutions like Clearblade or Litmus. Um, it's not there yet. But at the same time, Amazon is patient, and they have a lot of money, and AWS is the de facto cloud. So I think saying that they won't get there isn't probably a very um, good claim to make, but I would say they're not there yet. Azure also, in a very similar time frame, you can see how competitive AWS and Azure are, especially Azure trying to catch up to AWS. Um, Azure has this whole Azure Edge thing out right now, which you can take a look at, uh, which falls into their IoT Edge, IoT Edge suite uh, banner of IT services. Their whole idea there is to take individual microservices from Azure and run them locally on the edge with the same exact APIs that you would expect in the cloud layer. So you get some of their machine learning, some of their analytics, and some of their database storage engines. I don't remember exactly which ones off the top of my head, but they get replicated on the edge so you can basically, you know, more or less take code that was written for Azure Cloud and morph it to run against an Azure Edge. Um, but both of them, it's still, still a new game for them, and they're still trying to get there. Anybody else? Great. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all.